Okay, since you might have missed <clears throat> being the class, this is just a quick review of the lecture we did today uh, that should pretty much uh, catch you up on everything we did. So we're doing the Island of the Colorblind talk it, talk, Topic, Human Genome Chromatopsia, <clears throat> a little term one paper guidance which, which people can get from me at any time. Uh, just a reminder that we have a little secret eye puzzle up here for people to guess. Uh, I would probably recommend going to the Vibes of 45224 uh, playlist. And if you start with Rome B-52s and go down a few more videos, uh, less than 10 videos away uh, further in that playlist is a video that has these eyes. And uh, the clue is that the singer is appearing in another band's video than her own, but both the bands uh, came from Athens, Georgia, a college town at about the same time. So you can probably guess that. So uh, we're going to do a little investigation. The idea was to go a little investigation around. I actually brought in some Starbucks coffee because I also gave people a map of London and uh, 221 Baker Street, of course, is where Sherlock's Holmes theoretically lived and, and worked from uh, in the stories. And uh, I think uh, the series Sherlock with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch and his partner here, uh, who you've also seen in Lord of the Rings, are, are my favorite uh, Sherlock Holmes set in the modern era. Just, it turns out that uh, just at Baker Street, however, which is just right up here. Boop. Turns out that you can, not too far from uh, that historic place uh, on Baker Street is 126 Baker Street. And we'll just sort of pretend that we're stopping off there in London. Uh, what I like about this part of London is there's actually uh, there's actually a Starbucks in there. So in the corner, there's actually a Starbucks. So there we are at Starbucks. And this is where we start our little adventure today. And up the street that way and around the bend is Sherlock's place. So what we've given everybody today is another document right here phototransduction cascade and what I pointed out in class was we've seen this before in one of the first slideshows you got with me uh, it's depicting phototransduction <clears throat> it happens in both rods and cones there's certain states of proteins in the dark and the light Right here they're showing rhodopsin as the photopigment for, for rods, but the same system works in rods and cones. You activate rhodopsin. Rhodopsin in turn activates uh, a G-coupled protein. Uh, it's a G-coupled uh, protein receptor, a GTP protein uh, coupled receptor. Uh, transducin is what it's called in photoreceptor cells. This version of it has an alpha, beta, a gamma subunit it's off when it's bound to GDP, the diphosphate, and it gets activated. <clears throat> and when it does get activated, uh, basically you cause the exchange of the GDP for a fresh GTP, the triphosphate, and transducin dissociates into its subunits. And this active subunit, the alpha subunit, will then activate quiescent phosphodiesterase. This phosphodiesterase has alpha, beta, and, and gamma subunits. They are activated when they're bound by this activated GTP-bound form of the transducin, transducin A subunit. And you activate the activity of phosphodiesterase. And what does phosphodiesterase do? It takes cyclic GMP. You can look up cyclic GMP. It has a cyclic structure. The esterase breaks that cyclic bond so that you just have regular GMP, non-cyclic GMP. The key thing about this is that cyclic GMP, when it's normally at high concentration in the cell in the dark, 
it's bound and it keeps open these CNG, and these are cyclic nucleotide gated channels. And this is a cation channel, a lot of sodium and calcium are leaking in, and while that happens, you end up with uh, a certain charge in the photoreceptor cell. Uh, overall, there's a slight negative charge in the, in the cell compared to the outside, but you have a certain set relative voltage inside, voltage gradient from the inside to the outside of the cell. Now, what's happened in the light is when we drop these cyclic GMP levels, this gate closes and we no longer have the leaking in of sodium and calcium. And that causes the inside of the cell to become more negative. And, and that is a, a, actually an A wave we see doing ERGs. Uh, and we might actually do some real ERGs for one class in the future on my eye, so people can see it, but you get a downward, more negative internal of the cell, and that's what sets off photoreceptors. And uh, there's a B wave that follows that where you see the rest of the retina, the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells undergoing their voltage changes as they're activated. So this is the process. And then here is the key to thinking about the disease on Pingelat. And, and there's a lot of things you can guess about it even before you know any of the molecules involved or any of the genetics. Uh, it's inherited, you've learned. It's basically recessive. You need to get two, I guess, bad dysfunctional copies of the gene. Uh, achromatopes see fine at night. Their rod system works. Uh, only their cones don't work. They have no color. No long, medium, or short wavelengths. Okay, no red, green, blue type of uh, vision, just dim vision. Uh, during the day, their vision's really bleached out, all white, because the light intensity is far so intense that the rods are constantly activated. The cone cells that are set to respond in their sort of signal gain for much brighter light are just not present. So these patients don't have <clears throat> very good vision in bright light. Uh, so what in here do you think would have to be, well, let's, let's put it this way. What in this diagram would definitely not be an affected gene or protein in achromatopes? And you'll probably guess that, well, for certainly it's not rhodopsin because that has to do with just rods. But I will tell you that a lot of these other proteins in the visual transduction cascade with all their genes and subunits, some of these are in multiple gene families. And there are versions that work in the rod cell because they're just expressed in rods. And there's versions in the cone cells. So there's some separation of additional genes that are in rod or cone cells. So you can already really guess that whatever this defect is, the gene and the protein really has to be something that all three cone types use, but rods don't use. So it's some gene that's unique uh, to phototransduction cascade and operations of the cone cell. So that's what we need to know. And the next place we kind of go in London we had our Starbucks coffee, which I actually brought in today, so we could have Starbucks coffee. And we went instead to the next place. We would go to this place, Univers the University College London Institute of Ophthalmology. Because here you can get yourself into a library, and we can probably find the library and, and, and find some papers on chromatopsia genetics. And I gave people also today this paper. And let's say we get that paper at this place. Uh, I do have a photocopies of it already made if you want to come and pick it up. But one thing you'll notice on here is Paul Sieving is uh, one of the people in this group that did this research paper, contributed to it probably with patients, is the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Paul Sieving spent 15 years, just finishing recently, as the second uh, ever director of the National Eye Institute. And he also is an ophthalmologist and a PhD and a researcher. And 
he really shepherded in the age of gene therapy in modern medicine uh, through the vision science funding that the NEI did in the United States. So uh, this paper is about genes and loci that map to patients that have uh, achromatopsia. And it's a little bit around 2000. The gen genome has been sequenced here, but really candidate disease gene approach, this is a good lesson in the typical candidate disease gene approach is to look at pedigrees, and here you see male and female affected individuals in different family pedigrees. And, and you, you can immediately see, for instance, in this family, uh, the mother and father aren't affected, the children are, uh, they must be, that's, that's a hallmark of a recessive uh, condition where you need two copies of the disease version of the gene. And what you would do is look at specific sequences on chromosomes. They might be PCR products. They might just be of different length uh, because they're variable regions of the genome. They, they might have slight differences that change uh, a restriction enzyme site. There's some kind of test you can do to, uh, to find little variations in these locations between people and different chromosomes. And you can test for these different versions of these markers. And, and, and you can see where the disease is associated, and here the disease is, is marked with these dark circles, uh, where the disease, what interval the disease is associated uh, with members of the family. And, and you'll have crossing over as you go from one generation to the other. Of course, in meiosis, you have a crossing over uh, of copies of chromosomes and an exchange of DNA ends. And they're looking for where exchanges occur uh, and a, a boundary, where basically there's a region that is never found in an exchange and it's always associated with a disease member in the family. And usually you can get down to, if you're lucky, you can get a fairly small interval on a chromosome. In this paper, I believe they, they narrow it down here between this marker and this marker. So in this region, there's been crossing over events where uh, basically uh, the disease has not moved with the marker. And so they know there's some gene in this region. And there might be 50, 100 genes there. Uh, what they do then is, is look to see if there are any known genes there that might be uh, logically associated with your disease. Uh, so is there a protein that maybe is already known or, or a family member, now they're getting sequenced, they we're seeing the genes, you can see what their amino acids are. Is there anything there that might have something to do with how photoreceptor works? And it turns out there is, there was a gene for one of these. One of these protein subunits, the CNG gated channel. And you'll see in this paper that before this came out, people had already found that some people with achromatopsia have CNGA3 mutations, which is a cone-specific version of the alpha subunit of this channel. But they also found that when that gene was sequenced in the Pingalapes families, uh, their gene was just fine. So this wasn't the locus that explained the Pingalap genetics. But there was another locus on a different location in the genome, ACHM3 it's called, Achromatopsia locus 3, where that interval was mapped and they looked for genes and they found this gene structure in there, which was obviously, uh, through homology, they could already tell that this was a beta subunit of this channel family. And it turns out that this one is also a cone specific. And it turned out that people in these families in this paper had these muta had these variants. Here's amino acid serine 435 becoming a phenylalanine. Uh, and here's an arginine uh, codon being turned into a termination codon. So you get a truncation of the protein. Uh, here's a one base pair deletion, 
and uh, here's some uh, deletion, another deletion, and uh, one that alters a splice site, an intron 13 of this gene. So there's a lot of things that would basically alter the protein. And if you alter a protein that has a job too much, it doesn't do its job anymore. So this is the gene that we have to do. Uh, it wasn't the first one it turned out to be associated with some families in the world, but uh, it, you know people first found the alpha subunit gene on a different chromosome, number two. This one, even though it forms part of the same channel as a unit, it's on chromosome eight in the Q-arm 21. And basically, uh, this is a very good paper to learn all these lessons about the candidate disease gene approach and, and just basically uh, how things have kind of really kind of evolved since 2000. Uh, the first candidate disease gene approach that worked was to identify rhodopsin for some people around 1990 with uh, retinitis pigmentosa. And, uh, and you, know, you, you map a family's disease locus to an area of a chromosome, you see if there's any good candidates in that region that you would then bother sequencing because sequencing takes uh, a lot of time and money sometimes and you can't sequence everything uh, all the time. So that's kind of how that worked out. So we know we're looking for this CNGB3 gene. Uh, so there's a, that's a particular one that is just, it turns out, used in all three cone cells to make this channel. A different gene also exists uh, to make that subunit just in rod cells, okay? So that would mechanistically explain how if you, me if you mess up a gene that's needed for phototransduction, but it's just a cone-specific version of, of that protein, then that would just affect the cones, but leave your rods alone. So for your paper, I would kind of like people to get practice using the genome browser and to find their gene of interest. And I made a video you can watch to do that. I will very quickly just do the same thing here. University of uh, Genome, University of, Santa, University of California, Santa Cruz, edu. Usually you can go to the genome browser. My other video will give you more details of how to customize things, but you can, you can look for what you want to find. Uh, and I believe it's CNG, beta subunit three. We're gonna go looking for that. Oh, cyclic, I didn't uh, type. You, you have to type the right letters. Cyclic nucleotide gated channel, yeah, B. And you'll see as you type, genes that exist start to flash up here. We want the B3 version. Boom. And usually you'll jump right there. If you don't jump right to here and it doesn't look this simple, there's a few things you can do. You might find a lot of other tracks are turned on and you'll see that in the other video. And I've gone down here and it shows you how to just turn the tracks off, refresh the view. Uh, I also tell you how to use this configure button so that you can uh, make the text large enough so that you see it and don't go blind. And you can make your display window a little bit bigger. And here is the gene. Uh, in this case, here we are, chromosome 8. The red line here shows us on the chromosome diagram where this little gene is. It's in a location that's geographically called uh, Q-arm 21.3. If you, I explain how these are numbered a little bit more in the other video, so you can look at that. But you'll see here, this little diagram with the chevrons pointing this way to the left tell us that the sequence of the gene starts here and ends here and it's going backwards so we're looking at the bottom strand the way this chromosome is drawn so if you had the top strand of the dna across the top and the bottom strand across the other way uh, as you can see here the, the numbering is basically increasing from one side to the other. And that's the numbering of the top strand 
but this goes the opposite way, so we're looking at the bottom strand. If you want to, you can flip it by using this reverse button below the diagram. And you'll just flip the chromosome around, and, and you might like to look at your gene from left to right. The start is on the left, and here's it around the right. And one thing you'll notice right away is this whole gene uh, has a thin line area where you just have a thin horizontal line that is intron sequence. These thicker bars or bands, and sometimes they look like a thin bar, uh, sometimes you're zoomed in more and they're, they're much longer looking as we zoom in, those are exon sequence that get spliced together in the mature messenger RNA. Uh, I explain more about coding and non-coding parts of RNA in the video on the genome browser, so please take a look at that because there's some misconceptions about exon relationships to coding that, that some people, uh, even graduate students, I, I find uh, have, have, haven't quite understood because uh, it probably wasn't pointed out very well to them in some, some course, uh, but we'll correct that if you go look at the other video. Uh, the whole point of going here though in the genome browser is so you get used to finding genes of interest when you need them, good as a medical professional or as a researcher, and you can also get pictures as PDFs from here. You go to the view menu, to the PDF, and you'll be able to like download a current view. These are PDF graphic files. They're good as PDFs because they will resize and redraw to any scale you want. They won't get blocky. You can put them in posters, you can put them in papers, you can put them in talks. Uh, you can get a picture of this gene. You can also get a picture of the chromosome, the ideogram view of the chromosome, and you can use that as a figure in your term paper one. When you want to uh, know a lot about any gene, I recommend the uniprot.org database. You could type, uh, so we've got the cyclic nucleotide gated channel, B3. I can put the gene name in, uh, abbreviated form or, or longer terms if you want, but the gene name's best. And I can put human, we can search. Human should be at the top above you know, dog and other species. There it is. These are very good summaries of, of most things that you'll want to know about a gene or protein that you really don't know anything about yet. Uh, yeah, there's a little description of its function, uh, and there's all kinds of information on it, including disease variants. And I can see right away that this one, you'll notice sometimes it is altered and it causes Stargardt's disease, which is a, 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 a macular type affecting the central vision dystery, where you, the cells are dying and you become blind. Uh, some people don't lose all their cells though, same gene affected in a certain way, a certain variance. These variants uh, can also just cause achromatopsia. So you have your rod cells for the rest of your life until you're 85, until you pass on, uh, but you don't actually go blind. So that's something to realize about many genetic diseases as well. The same gene can be affected in different ways, changing the protein in different ways. Sometimes might give you a mild form of disease uh, almost maybe disease so mild you don't really have to worry about it, or a disease that's something intermediate or something really bad and is more drastic and harmful to a cell or the tissue or the organ uh, in which it does its job. Uh, this also has in this section a variant viewer, which is kind of good to just look at a plot uh, of all the variants. I usually go over here and just I just want to see what are considered the likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants in this gene. And along the top, I see it has 809 amino acids. And at each location here are some pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants that are accepted as being that way. And these are the amino acids they are changed to. So in this position, normally not an arginine has become an arginine and it is pathogenic. Down here on the asterisk row, these are changes that have resulted in a premature stop codon, which would truncate a potential protein at that point. One thing you can see right away, and you'll notice for many genes where there's a lot of information like this, 
about disease associations is there really is no part of the protein that you that is immune from being messed around with. All parts of a protein as a whole are there for a reason, simply structural arrangement, maybe catalytic sites, protein interaction regions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything is critical enough that you can probably find a variant that ruins it. And we'll learn more about genetic diseases in the course, but these variants, uh, these aren't all of them that are, exist now. And even if we caught up knowing what all they all were in the population, if you wait another year, there'll be new ones. People are being created every day in the world with new variants in this gene during meiosis, during fertilization, uh, and you have a DNA replication error, you introduce a variant, and it may or may not be disease causing. It might even make a change that's beneficial, who knows, but uh, new founders of specific new variants will always be born and created every day around the world. And so there'll never really be a time when this is done. Uh, but this is the important of understanding that molecular mechanism has now come really into the clinic. Uh, med students don't get an opportunity to learn much about it. Uh, I have a lot about 14 or so over the years in Bark medical students working in my lab. All the latest ones right now, about six of them doing their research projects within their med school. They have to get some research experience. They've come to work with me because they want to learn practical human genetics. We sequence kids with some very rare pediatric retinal diseases. Uh, we sequence some candidate genes that are involved in their diseases, fever, nori disease, and retinoschisis. And if we're lucky, we find a variant that explains why that child has a retinal dystrophy type threatening condition. Ones we look at affect the retinal vasculature. So that's kind of all I wanted to say about that. Uh, I will also probably post another little video reading a few passages. Uh, maybe I'll read them here now. I want people to think about a few things uh, as they, you'll, you'll see I've given you a guide in, the, in Moodle on some of the content I'd like you to put into your term one paper about Island of the Colorblind. I, I want you all to say something, however, uh, bes besides explaining the molecular reason for the, the condition, uh, I want your thoughts and your feelings, your thoughts, your analysis of certain aspects of, of how does this particular condition impact an individual and, and how might that relate to whatever society they're in. And we, we already know, for instance, that we kind of have two groups of, kind of two categories of achromatopsia patients in this, this story, this true story. We have people in, in, in these Polynesian islands in that society, but we also have people from the United States, uh, just some individuals uh, and and a Canute himself, and his name is Canute, you pronounce the K, and Canute uh, in Norway, and his sister, uh, in a society better able to educate them and give them more advanced tools to get their education, and of course they've, they've actually both done fine in university and become specialists in their fields, uh, but they're also in a modern society where they're, they're very alone. Uh, not really meeting other chromatopsia patients than in another society uh, with a completely different kind of economic system and, and level of resources. Most people are, are, are under, understand this masculine disease, as they call it, because everybody has relatives that has it. And, and, and people kind of adapt in different ways. Uh, so one thing we, we learned uh, about the education uh, of these two worlds meeting. I'm going to read this section uh, of the book around page 68 in mine. Uh, Knut is, in, they're, they're in Pingalap, and he's, he's talking to a mother who has two daughters uh, with achromatopsia. And it says, Knut did his best to explain to her the mechanisms of her her heredity to reassure her that her daughters would not go blind, that there was nothing wrong with her as a wife or a mother, 
that the masculine was not necessarily a barrier to receiving an education and holding a job, and that with proper optical aids and eye protection, the proper understanding her daughters could do as well as any other child. But it was only when he made clear that he himself had the masculine, she suddenly stared at him in a new way at this point, that his words seemed to take on a solid reality for her and, and for the future of her daughters. So that was something that struck me. I'll read another section on page 70. They're talking about how Canute himself and the children that they see in Polynesia, they've kind of adapted uh, really for the sake of people around them that, that see just fine and normal. Uh, they, they've done things like memorizing rules for what colors common objects and things are, uh, even though they have no perception of the color themselves. And that's really to de-stress all the normal vision people around them uh, and, uh, and to sort of help them feel, you know, I guess more easily to fit in with their peers. So I'll read here, thus we could already observe in these achromatopic children in Mand how a sort of theoretical knowledge and know-how, a compensatory hypertrophy of curiosity and memory were rapidly developing in reaction to their perceptual problems. They were learning to compensate cognitively for what they could not directly perceive or comprehend. And so that's true of many people who, who are blind have an amazing memory uh, for learning things uh, that are communicated them in some fashion the first time uh, because they've just had to exercise that part of their cognitive ability since they were babies maybe. Uh, so on a chromatopic people like Canute, do they have abilities that most of us don't have even though they don't have cones? Uh, I don't know. Uh, is that a disease or is that just a, a person with a different adaption? Is that a person that's, I'm short, somebody's tall. Uh, we all fit in somewhere in society. Think about that. Uh, on page 72, uh, I won't read it all, but it, it talks about how Newt rebelled, Canute rebelled at being regarded as disabled and refused to learn Braille by touch instead using his sight to read the raised dots, which cast tiny shadows on the page. He was severely punished for this and forced to wear a blindfold in classes. Soon after, Canute ran away from the school, but determined to read normal print, taught himself to read at home. Finally, having convinced the school administrators that he would never make a willing student, Canute was allowed to return to regular school. Canute's sister, Britt, dealt with her loneliness and isolation as a child by identifying with and becoming a member of the blind community. She kind of did the opposite of Canute. She flourished at the School for the Blind as much as Canute hated it. She became fluent in Braille and has spent her professional life as an intermediary between the blind and sighted worlds, supervising the transcription and production of books into Braille in the, at the Norwegian Library for the Blind. Like Canute, Brent is intensely musical and auditory and loves to close her eyes and surrender herself to the non-visual domain of music. But equally, she relaxes by doing needlework using a jeweler's loop attached to her glasses to keep her hands free. Another section I want to just read a little bit of uh, on the island of Pompeii and about page 75 in my version of the book. Uh, they've just been amazed to have been invited to give some seminars on achromatopsia. Uh, from the neurology point of view, the ophthalmology point of view, and from the achromatope point of view. And uh, at first they thought, well, how can we give talks to these doctors who live and work in this area where they have more achromatopes than everywhere in the world? And they were expecting that these doctors would know as much as they did. But they were surprised to find out that all the physicians that came to the room, many of them almost were oblivious to the fact that they had patients who had achromatopsia. Uh, and it says here, as I read the book, one reason for this perhaps had to do with the simple act of recognizing and naming the phenomena. Everyone with the maskin has behaviors and strategies which are obvious once one is attuned to them. The squinting, the blinking, the avoidance of bright light. It was these which allowed an instant mutual recognition between Canute and the affected children the moment he landed on Pingalap. 
But before one has assigned a meaning to these behaviors or categorized them, one may just overlook them. And there's also a medical attitude enforced by necessity, which, mediate, which militates against proper recognition of the maskin. Greg and many others have worked incessantly to train good doctors in underdoctored Micronesia, but their hands are constantly full with critical conditions demanding immediate attention. Amoebiasis and other parasitic infections are rife. There were four patients with amoebic liver abscesses in the hospital when we were there. There are constant outbreaks of measles and other infectious diseases, possibly because there are not enough resources to vaccinate the children. Tuberculosis is endemic in the islands as leprosy once was. Widespread chronic vitamin A deficiency, probably linked to the shift to a Western diet, can cause severe eye and ear problems, including night blindness, lower resistance to infection, and lead to potentially fatal malabsorption syndromes. So basically, the doctors are just busy uh, keeping people from getting illnesses that kill them, and they just kind of don't have time to deal with a chromatopsia. So that was rather interesting. What does that say about the delivery of your healthcare system, no matter what country you live in? Here in the West, many ophthalmologists might work a while before they see somebody with a chromatopsia, I suppose. And certainly it might be a, a long time before a family doctor does. Uh, I'll, last thing I want to read from the book is the last paragraph. Talking about Frances Futterman, who had, was herself in a chromatope and had started to really organize a chromatopes over long distances through a newsletter and then eventually on the internet. Her network and newsletter and now website on the internet have indeed been very successful. I've done much to annul geographical distances and apartness. There are hundreds of members spread around the world in New Zealand, Wales, Saudi Arabia, Canada, and now in Pompeii too. And Francis, Francis is in contact with them all by phone, fax, mail, internet. Perhaps this new network, the island in cyberspace, is the true island of the colorblind. So that's all we'll say about that. Hope everybody's thinking about a few things. But that, in a nutshell, covers what we covered in class today. If you have any questions, just uh, email me or come up and talk with me. I'm usually up in the fourth floor, and I can't escape, okay? in Dodge Hall. Bye-bye.